the court, unlike Congress, does not have the power of the purse. It can't withhold funding. It's not like the president. It can't command an army. It doesn't have the power of the sword. It literally depends on the public believing that what it is doing is legitimate for its institutional credibility. And so when the public parts faith with the court, that's a really significant moment and it should give the court pause. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Now, I've had a number of podcasts focusing on the Supreme Court because their actions and rulings are essential to the functioning of this nation, and they've been making a lot of news because those rulings and actions have ranged from the outrageous, Clarence Thomas's bought and paid for lifestyle, to the shocking, the reversal of Roe v. Wade. But today we're going to talk about the actual cases that are before the court this term. And to do that, I'm joined today by Melissa Murray and Kate Shaw. Melissa and Kate are two of the three hosts of Crooked Media's legal podcast, Strict Scrutiny. Both Kate and Melissa are constitutional law professors. Melissa at the NYU School of Law, focusing on constitutional law, family law, criminal law, and reproductive rights and justice. And Kate at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law in New York City, focusing on constitutional law, legislation, and administrative law. Kate also teaches a seminar on the Supreme Court, worked in the Obama White House Counsel's Office, and focuses her writing on executive power, the law of democracy, and reproductive rights and justice. Melissa, who was a clerk for Justice Sotomayor when she served on the Second Circuit, focuses her writing on the legal regulation of intimate life. Strict Scrutiny, hosted by Melissa and Kate, and their co-host, another constitutional law professor, Leah Littman, provides an in-depth, accessible, and sometimes irreverent analysis of the Supreme Court, its cases, its culture, its personalities. I like it not only because it breaks down the legal headlines to make it simple, it emphasizes what those big legal questions mean to our daily lives. And to me, that's a real help. So without further ado, please welcome my guests, Crooked Media Darlings, Constitutional Law Professors, and host of Strict Scrutiny, Melissa Murray and Kate Shaw. Welcome, Melissa and Kate. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. We're happy to be here. Thanks for joining me. I mean, all three hosts of Strict Scrutiny are brilliant lawyers and constitutional professors, but you guys are also fundamentally fun, which is not something that anyone has ever called me. So uh, I hope I'm not going to be the dull friend in this conversation. Doubtful. Doubtfully. <laughs> that's usually my role, honestly. Is, is that your job? Okay. Well, that's, <laughs> little bit, little that, that'll bit. be Kate's job, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> so I'm having you guys on today to talk about what's going on with the Supreme Court. We're in this election year now. So most people have kind of stopped paying attention to the courts and they haven't done t- anything too well, you guys haven't, but you know, regular folks out here. Um, and they haven't done anything too outrageous yet. So I think it's just really important with this particular court that we don't take our eyes off them for a second. And that's why I'm having you guys on today. We are nodding vigorously at everything you just said. I'm a little alarmed when you say that, Lee. I know. <laughs> like, I'm sure you are. We're a little alarmed. Yeah, it, but it's you know it's based on the fact that like the most people that I talk to that I'm with one of the reasons I started Politics Girl in the first place was because all these wonderful educated people that I was hanging out with were like Meh, we're not paying attention like why does it matter you know I, when I first started the project it was right after Obama had lost the second midterms and literally no one I knew cared they were like it doesn't matter it's all going to be the same and I thought nope that's entirely wrong and it is amazing how many people who even have the time and the background to know what's going on are not paying attention. They just can't. It's too much. They don't want to. So when it comes down to things like what's going on with the Supreme Court, it's amazing how many people are just like, eh, shh, turn it off. It's perhaps understandable that I think a lot of the public are a little fatigued by the court. I mean, the court has been doing the most for the last couple of years. So it overruled Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, like just laying waste to 50 years worth of precedent. Every other week, it seems like ProPublica drops some huge scandalous story about the conservative effort to put justices in their pockets. That, that seems maybe to be working a little bit. And Importantly, the cases that the court's hearing this term are a little wonky and technical, and so they're not quite as sexy as the prospect of overruling affirmative action or overruling abortion. And so I think they're likely to get missed, both by the mainstream media and by the public more generally. But this term is a really consequential one for the Supreme Court because the whole question of how government runs and whether corporate interests are just going to get to have their way with the American public is really up for grabs. And there 
there are some really technical cases, but they go to the very essential question of how government runs. And even leaving that aside, just the substance of the term, the court's going to be really involved in the 2024 presidential election. We've already seen them take certiorari on some cases involving whether Donald Trump can actually be a candidate on the ballot in some states. And more importantly than that, whoever wins this presidential election is going to determine the trajectory of this court for at least a generation and a half. Right now, we have a conservative six to three supermajority that was basically installed by Donald Trump, a president who didn't even win the popular vote. He managed to install three justices, got a majority, a supermajority of six justices. If there is a Republican president who wins in 2024, it is all but certain that Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas, who are well past 70, are going to step down. And they will likely be replaced by teenagers, maybe even fetuses, who will be on the court for probably another 50 years, cementing that six to three conservative supermajority literally until the end of time. And so when people say the court's on the ballot, it really couldn't be more true in this case. A hundred percent, which is exactly why I had you guys on today, because I wanted to go into those minutia, quiet things and the big things that are constitutionally accurate about what's going on with our courts and if they're allowed to decide our laws or if our Congress should be allowed to decide our laws who were decided by the people. So I want to talk to you about all these things today, because I know the Supreme Court completed the final arguments of 2023, sort of mid-December, and they've already had a number of important cases this term, but we won't hear most of the decisions until June. So I thought I would just go through some of the biggest cases to look out for, some of which already have been argued and some of which will be argued this year, and just get your thoughts. Can you tell people why uh, we sometimes have to wait for June for the Supreme Court to give us some of their rulings? How come we sometimes hear uh, opinions right away and sometimes we have to wait till the end of the term? Sure. You know, there's no rule that governs when the justices issue their decisions. They start hearing arguments in October. Their term typically goes until the end of June. So they often start issuing opinions right around now, kind of January. Um, But it is almost invariably the case that the biggest, most high stakes, most divisive cases come down to the end of the term. So it's almost always the very last week of June when all of the big cases come down. So two terms ago, that's when Dobbs, the decision Melissa mentioned overruling Roe versus Wade came down. It was also near the end of the term that the court struck down New York's concealed carry law, basically the law that required you to show some special need to carry a weapon like in your pocket or in your purse in New York City or New York State. Um, We can talk about the court's gun cases, both that the court has decided and some that are on the docket this year, if you're interested, those in addition to everything Melissa said are super, super important opinions or or super important cases that will generate super important opinions. But the sort of short answer is the justices control their docket and they typically are debating and negotiating and revising down to the wire. And that is ordinarily the end of June, sometimes the beginning of July in the last couple of terms. So we're going to have to wait until then to get the big ones. Also, Lee, it's really hard to write opinions if you're on a private jet somewhere. So, you know. Yeah, it's hard. You, I, you know, if you're on a black. fishing boat in Alaska, it's just tough. I mean, we all know like, that. Like, how can you do your job, especially when your job only pays $276,000 a year? You're poor. You're basically a destitute, I mean, you know, champagne basically. drinking, glacier martini. Popper. Yeah. Popper. It's very hard. Yeah. It's very hard. And very. we need to understand that. Okay. So, I feel for them. I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so let's start off with where we're at with the presidential immunity cases. I know that special counsel Jack Smith has asked the Supreme Court to fast track an appeal by Trump on whether he's immune from a lawsuit for actions he took while he was in office. This is the kind of, if the president does it, it's not a legal argument. So a federal trial court has already ruled that Trump is not above the law and can be prosecuted for his actions while he was president. But Jack Smith was concerned the appeal of the case could seriously undermine the timing of his criminal trial, which is currently set for March. 2024. And the special counsel argued that it's imperative and of major public importance that this case is decided before the presidential election because Trump is obviously the leading candidate for the Republican Party. Now, as I understand it, the justices denied that request at the end of December, saying they wanted to wait for the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. to weigh in first, which was a essentially punting, and in my opinion, helping Trump run out the clock, which is totally part of his strategy. But the U.S. Court of Appeals is fast-tracking their consideration of the case. Is that right? So it could come back to the Supreme Court sooner rather than later? So that that's right. Um, you, you've laid it out really well. Um, 
if you are interested in the mm-hmm. Trump indictments, my colleague Andrew Weissman and I have a book coming out about the Trump indictments where we've annotated all of the various content of the four different criminal indictments against Donald Trump so that people can follow along if and when these trials actually happen. But that's an open question. The January 6th insurrection trial that is supposed to happen on March 4th really depends on this question of whether or not Donald Trump is immune from prosecution because these acts were apparently undertaken while he was president or somehow in the scope of his presidency. And those are questions that have to be hashed out. As you said, Judge Chutkin, who is the district court judge who's in charge of this entire proceeding at the first level in the federal system, has said that he is not above the law. So that went on to the D.C. Circuit. Jack Smith, as you say, um, wanted to fast track this and ask the court to take it up before judgment, um, before the intermediate appellate court could decide this issue. The court declined to do so. There was an oral argument on January 9th in the D.C. Circuit before a three-judge panel. We've heard a lot about the substance of that oral argument. It was really explosive. But we're now waiting for that decision. And if that decision comes back, there are a lot of different ways it could go. The three-judge panel might send it back to Judge Chutkin to determine whether or not the actions undertaken on January 6th of 2021 were within the scope of Donald Trump's office as president at the time or outside of that orbit. Or alternatively, they could just decide he's not immune. They could ratify or affirm Judge Chutkin's ruling below. Um, If that happens, Donald Trump could appeal the ruling of the three-judge panel, and that might require the entire D.C. Circuit to weigh in on this, an en banc panel. And from there, he could then appeal to the Supreme Court, which would then have to decide if they would take the case. What's an en en banc panel? An en banc panel is like all the judges like get to weigh in and get to hear this again. So we basically do it all over again, except for everyone. And again, As you say, all of these different permutations, going back to Judge Chutkin, then getting appealed again, and then maybe an en banc appeal, all of those things take time. And we're getting farther and farther away from that March 4th deadline. We're basically less than two months away from March 4th. And this question hasn't been decided. It has to be decided before this trial can get underway. And I think because it's likely to be delayed, that means Donald Trump has already won, even though we haven't even gotten to a court of law. Woof. I mean, the whole thing makes no sense to me, logically or constitutionally, that the president is above the law, because it seems to be in the complete opposition of what this country was founded on, which was our opposition to unchecked monarchy, doing whatever they wanted to do whenever they wanted to do it. And we put checks and balances specifically in our founding documents for this reason, right? The point is no one is supposed to be above the law. So I'm not exactly sure what we're even talking about here. On the merits, I think that's exactly right. And that is essentially what Judge Chuckin, in her opinion, decisively rejecting this argument, concluded, we don't have kings in this country, we have presidents, and presidents, like anyone else, are subject to law, not in the same way as anyone else. There are certain accommodations that need to be made if we're talking about civil suits against a president or criminal suits against a president. Pretty clearly, everybody agrees you can't actually, under most circumstances, criminally prosecute somebody while they are president. But this is about a former president. And what Donald Trump is suggesting is that he has for life a get-out-of-jail-free card that totally insulates him in an absolute way from indictment or prosecution or conviction for anything done while president plausibly connected to his duties as president. Maybe not even plausibly. I'm not even sure if he agrees with that limitation. But certainly anything done plausibly connected to his duties as president, which he claims applies to what happened leading up to and on January 6th. And again, on the merits, I don't think this is an argument that this panel of the D.C. Circuit has any chance of buying. And I actually think even this hyper-conservative, often quite partisan Supreme Court is not very likely to endorse. I imagine- Kate is the optimist. That's true. Podcast. That's not clear. <laughs> um, <laughs> but honestly, even non-optimists on this question feel pretty confident that there is not a majority that would endorse this position of absolute immunity. Now, maybe there are a couple. Maybe this is a case that Trump loses 7-2 or even 6-3, but it's very hard for me to imagine a majority siding with his arguments. But as Melissa said, 
you know, the merits decision, who ultimately wins or loses, is only part of the picture. The timing is critical. And even if he has a, a loser of an argument, if he's able to run out the clock until the presidential election, Jack Smith is a federal official. So if Trump is once again at the head of the executive branch, he will make this case go away. And that is what he is trying yeah. to do. If Trump is once again the head of the executive branch, we can kiss the rule of law goodbye, period, the end, along with democracy and everything else. <laughs> Well, did you catch what Kate said, Lee? I mean, this is the best part. Kate essentially said there might be two or three members of the Supreme Court who are basically tyranny forward in their thinking. <laughs> like, <laughs> Here's what I don't understand. As a regular normie, you guys are both constitutional lawyers and professors, but as a regular normie, like, I don't understand this argument. This is, you know, Trump saying he could get SEAL Team 6 to assassinate his enemies. Well, that was a hypothetical. Yes, that was it's a, a hypothetical. hypothetical. It's a hypothetical. Right. But in that hypothetical, if he wins this case that says he has utter immunity, can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, for however long he wants, doesn't that also mean that Joe Biden could do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, whatever he wants? Absolutely. But I think Trump correctly assesses that that's not actually a threat to him because Joe Biden is not a fundamentally lawless person and he yeah, is gonna, not going to do the, the things. Yeah. I yeah. mean, even if the court blesses his ability to deviate from it, that's not in his character. And it's honestly not in the character of the vast majority of individuals who have held the highest public office in this country. But it is certainly, it seems, in the character of former and aspiring future President Donald Trump. Okay, so let's talk about the other case uh, with former and aspiring President Donald Trump, um, where the Republican Party of Colorado has asked the justices to reinstate Trump's name on their state primary ballot after the Colorado Supreme Court ruled that Trump was disqualified from being on the ballot because of his actions surrounding the January 6th attack, which is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which basically says you can't hold government office if you've previously taken an oath to support the Constitution and then participated in an insurrection or some sort of rebellion against the United States. That's constitutionally bound. That is right there. So that feels pretty obvious. Um, but while the main Secretary of State agreed and took him off the ballot there too, the California Secretary of State did not. And he's still on our ballot here. So what are your thoughts on that? So I think this is a really tough question. Um, I, I don't know if your listeners know this, but states get to make their own rules about elections. So, you know, like, yes, there is a national election, but each state gets to make its own rules for how the election will be conducted, which is why we have these 50 different questions about whether or not Donald Trump is going to be on the ballot in a particular state. In Colorado, the Colorado Supreme Court decided four to three that Donald Trump was ineligible to be on the ballot because of his actions on January 6th, which it said were tantamount to participating in an insurrection. And if you have been in an insurrection, according to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, then you cannot stand for federal office. There are still some big questions here. You know, one threshold question, was Donald Trump engaged in insurrection on January 6th? The Colorado Supreme Court, by vote of four to three, said that, yes, he was. And the district, the Colorado trial court below also said that. Then there are sort of substantive legal questions about whether or not Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is intended to apply to the president, since the president isn't specifically mentioned in the text of that provision of the 14th Amendment. Now, there are really good arguments that suggest, like, of course, it would be included. Like, why would you name all of these other federal offices, but then exempt the one office that was sort of like the big kahuna office? That doesn't make any sense. But then there are others who say, well, you know, there are other plausible reasons why it might be excluded. So, you know, there are, I think, arguments on both sides. I personally think there's a very strong argument that the president is included here. Um, but this is going to the Supreme Court. And I have to say, I think Donald Trump is going to win here, if only because the prospect of a patchwork quilt of ballots in which Donald Trump is on the ballot in some states, but not others, is going to seem really unappealing to these justices, even the three beleaguered liberal justices. I think they're going to want a decision that provides uniformity, that insulates this next election cycle from claims that it was somehow unjust or improper because Donald Trump was not allowed to have a say and the people weren't allowed to weigh in fully. I think for that reason, they are going to overrule, overturn the Colorado Supreme Court's decision and basically give us an interpretation of this provision of the 14th Amendment that's really gone understudied and unused. Yeah. 
I mean, look, I, I get that argument. And personally, I want Trump to be the nominee. I want the good people of America to decimate him and his horrible party at the ballot box. So there's no question that he and his ideas are un American loser positions. But it does seem crazy that the guy who clearly would have retained power by force if he could have gets the chance to run again. That that feels crazy. And yet I understand that it's going to be better overall to have people not say, well, the only reason he didn't win is because the Democrats took him off the ballot in Colorado. You know what I mean? Like I just, constitutionally, it seems like it should be obvious. He shouldn't be on any ballot. But I also feel like even if the president is untouchable when he's in office, all of those congressional minions and co-conspirators that are in Congress, they shouldn't have been able to stay. At the very least, they shouldn't have been able to run again in 2022 under that constitutional section. Um, I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene was at the Willard Hotel with the Roger Stone crew talking about it being 1776. Why she's still allowed to be in Congress right now is ludicrous to me under that same section of the Constitution. Yeah. And I mean, in some ways, there's this irony in that I think that I basically agree with Melissa's prediction, which is that the court will reverse the Colorado Supreme Court. But on the merits, again, it actually seems pretty clear that Trump should be disqualified, as should other key architects of and participants in January 6th, not just Trump. Um, and so if the court does anything other than just affirm Colorado, it's going to be animated by concerns beyond just what the best reading of the Constitution and the language at issue is, right? It'll be animated by these concerns about, well, it's not great for the court to be viewed as usurping this important democratic role. The people should get to decide whom will govern and lead them. And, you know, I, I actually don't think those kinds of practical considerations are irrelevant. But this conservative supermajority has told us time and time again, well, the practical consequences, gun violence, Forced pregnancies, going septic in parking lots. That's not our job to evaluate. Our job is to read the words written in the Constitution, maybe consult some dictionaries, maybe read the Federalist Papers, and tell America what the words mean. That's it. We'll let the politicians handle the rest. And that's never been how it works, yet they say that it works that way. And, and yet, I think they're going to do something very different right here. They're also going to overturn a, you know, the Supreme Court in a different state, right? So that makes sense. They're basically saying, well, your state's rights go only so far until we decide that they don't. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have right now, would you be able to list them and tell me how much they cost? Most of us think we could, and most of us are wrong. It's amazing how many subscriptions we have that we don't even know about, which means it's amazing how much money we're paying with little awareness. That's why Rocket Money is so helpful. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. It shows you all your subscriptions in one place, and if there's something you don't want or can no longer afford, you can cancel it with a tap and completely bypass the phone call with customer service. Rocket Money will even try to negotiate for you to get a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills by 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money does the rest. It's a terrific service, which is probably why Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped its members save an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use and cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. That's rocketmoney.com slash politicsgirl. R-O-C-K-E-T money.com slash politics girl. Oh boy, is it cold America or what? That means most of us are trying to find the right temperature when we sleep. Did you know that your temperature at night has one of the greatest impacts on the quality of your sleep? If you're one of those people who wakes up too hot or too cold, then I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made Bed Sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics to make temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Miracle Made silver infused sheets are not only thermoregulating, but also prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Plus, they're just really nice, deliciously high quality bedding without the horrible high price. I have to tell you, I'm so grateful to this company because not only are they creating a terrific product, but they're truly supportive of this show. They want the world to be a better place. They want people to have this information and they respect the type of listeners we have. Smart, educated, engaged. 
and they are reaching out directly to us. And that means a lot to me. So I hope you'll give this product a chance, but see for yourself. Go to trymiracle.com slash politics girl to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code politicsgirl at checkout, you will get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, they'll give you a full refund. Upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that is trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring the Politics Girl podcast. Okay, so because you guys are both work in reproductive health and rights and talk about that as far as uh, the rights of man, um, and in this case, the rights of women, uh, on December 13th, the justices added two cases to their docket that challenged the legality of the most common way people get abortions in this country, which is the abortion drug Mifepristone. One case has a group of anti-abortion doctors, which are called the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, appealing a previous case where they attempted to get the FDA's to pull the approval of misopristone completely. For people that don't know, this drug, uh, misopristone, was developed and approved for use in the 80s in Europe. It was then approved and became available in the US in 2000. And it is a drug that is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. So these right-wing zealots were hoping to pull this drug, this essential medicine, (laughs) from the market, not because there's anything wrong with it or there's anything wrong with it uh, medically, but because they just don't like what it was being used for. And the other case is the same group, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, claiming that the access to this drug has become too accessible. So they claim that the FDA has extended the length of time where the drug can be used, and they got rid of the requirement that people had to see a doctor to obtain the drug. They're basically looking to do what they did with abortion clinics which is to make things sort of like unnecessarily difficult so people just can't get the abortion. Um, They're trying to tie the whole thing up in red tape, like when abortion clinics were forced to do vaginal ultrasounds or show pictures to the pregnant person or wait a day or passing regulations that the hallways had to be the right width or the clinic had to have a doctor on the premises with local hospital privileges. Just endless hoops to make the entire process or even running the clinic itself back in the day too difficult. And now they're trying to do that with the abortion drug, Would you like to speak a little bit to these two cases? I don't think it's just about making abortion more complicated to access and provide. I think the threat that medication abortion or self-managed abortion poses is that it can basically undo what happened in Dobbs. So if Dobbs returns the abortion question to the states and now this state can do what it wants about abortion and this state can permit it and this state can restrict it. In a world where we have Federal Express or UPS or just the USPS, medication abortion upends all of that by allowing individuals to send these drugs across state lines to people who can privately manage their own health care. And that really is the threat here. Like There was a huge victory for the anti-abortion movement with Dobbs, and the availability of medication abortion threatens to completely upend and make it pointless. Right. And so that I think helps tee up and explain why there is so much attention to mifepristone and eliminating access to self managed abortion. I mean, it's all of the things you suggested, but at base, this is the drug that could completely upend the Dobbs quote unquote settlement. So it's a backdoor to a national abortion ban, a way of getting around the issue of bodily autonomy women still have in certain states or women are not supposed to have in certain states by taking the access to what they need to follow through with these procedures. Like you put this in place and you layer it on top of these bans in certain states about traveling to other states to seek abortion care and suddenly you don't need Congress to pass a national ban. You have in effect a web of different restrictions that cobbled together are as effective as a national ban on abortion. Yeah. And I'll say this case intersects with one of the sort of big themes this term that is a little bit under the radar, as you mentioned at the outset, but that is these cases attacking sort of the capacity and power of government writ large. So the specific claims here aren't really about abortion, at least as the case is framed. They're about the specific procedures that the FDA utilized in 
initially approving mifepristone, although that's actually sort of off the table in the case that the court is going to hear, but more specifically in loosening some of the restrictions that initially attended the prescription and use of mifepristone. So as you mentioned, the elimination of the in-person dispensing requirement, the expansion of the number of weeks following the last menstrual period during which mifepristone can be used to terminate a pregnancy, the ability to actually send by mail, which is a relatively recent development. So these anti-abortion doctors under the umbrella of this Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine have basically challenged all these things, but again, package the challenge as genuine concern about the rigor and soundness of the specific procedures deployed by the Food and Drug Administration to loosen some of the restrictions. Of course, the end game is exactly what Melissa just mentioned. It is making it as difficult and ultimately impossible to access legal abortion as possible, but it is doing it in an incremental way. I think the parallel here that you drew lead to efforts before Dobbs to chip away at abortion access to make it more difficult to create all of these obstacles and hassles to accessing abortion as laying the groundwork, desensitizing the public, sort of very, very tactical kind of antecedents to the big ask to overrule Dobbs. I think we're sort of in that moment now with an effort to go much further than Dobbs, which is not to say that states can prohibit abortion, which is what Dobbs says. But the next frontier is that Abortion becomes functionally inaccessible in many states and maybe ultimately all states, but ultimately impermissible, right, under the law and under the Constitution. That, I think, is really the end game. But we're still on that path. Yeah, we're absolutely on that path. And I think what people should also be thinking about is that this is a 40-year-old drug, a drug that we've had for over 20 years. It's completely approved. It's medically sound. But if these people are successful with this case, the result could not only upend abortion access in this country, but it also kind of opens up a whole new can of worms about FDA approved drugs, right? Because if we can just pull drugs from use for no particular reason after 20 years, like what's next? I mean, honestly, in my opinion, big pharma should be against this case. Like they should be they calling, are. yeah, they should be calling their rich buddies in Congress and the courts being like, yo, don't let this happen because it's going to open a huge can of worms. I mean, it just seems obvious to me that this is way bigger than what they're trying to do, and they're going to open up a million doors. The pharmaceutical companies actually have been very vocal in expressing their alarm about the court allowing the lower court opinions in this case to stand. They have suggested that the entirety of the FDA's approval process, which has been viewed as the gold standard worldwide for drug safety and efficacy, is kind of, you know, in the crosshairs in this case. And I think that's one reason that there is, to my mind, a chance at least that the justices will hesitate before embracing these lower court rulings that allow these limitations or found that these limitations needed to be reimposed on the use of mifepristone. And I think another door that this set of cases may open is just the entire question of who gets to come to federal court and plead their case. Like as a general matter, in order for federal courts to hear a case, the individual complaining has to have what's known as standing, which is to say that they have been injured by something the defendant has done and their injury is fairly traceable to the defendant's conduct. The physicians here, the anti-abortion physicians who are bringing this case, have a pretty tenuous, um, specious, if you will, claim of injury here. I mean, they're basically saying that they have been deprived of the aesthetic injury of watching live babies born. And, you know, if, if you sort of thread that together, it's not only just a way to sort of open the door to anyone being able to bring any kind of cockamamie claim to federal court. It's also a little fetal personhood curious, right? I mean, this idea that the doctors have this vested interest in seeing live babies born means that we are already imbuing the fetus, the unborn, with the kind of attributes, aesthetic attributes that we associate with living people. Yeah. That, there's another door we probably don't want to be opening. Oh, we're, it's, it's getting open. It's open. Um, yeah. I mean, well, listen, since we're still, we're talking about big pharma, I just, before I go on to the biggest case, it seems like the court is reviewing the settlement 
that was made between the Department of Justice and the people who manufactured Oxycontin because there's questions uh, with the terms of the agreement. Now, if people don't know, Purdue Pharma, which is owned by the Sackler family, has been in the news for years because they falsely marketed Oxycontin as a non-addictive opiate treatment, which then contributed to this kind of crippling nationwide addiction America has to this drug and thousands and thousands of people dying. But when the decision came down, the company, which is just filled with an entire family of horrifyingly grotesque rich people who could care less about human life, uh, agreed to pay $6 billion settlement and have their company help people with their recovery efforts. But it basically shielded the family itself from any additional civil liability. Um, and it didn't personally find any of the family members who made billions of dollars off this tragedy guilty of anything. Sure, it was a big settlement and they were punished. Uh, but honestly, they're all still crazy rich and they literally got away with murder. So a lot of people around the country, including President Biden's administration, have called for an additional review of the settlement, particularly the conditions that are protecting the Sacklers personally. What are your thoughts on that case? It's a little bit of a hard case to predict in that it's an unusual posture, right? So in this case, the parties to this bankruptcy settlement are actually on board with the settlement. It is just an official inside the Justice Department known as the tr bankruptcy trustee who objects to the terms of the settlement and I think is concerned both about this insulation of individual family members and also potentially the precedent that it feels like this might set for future bankruptcy agreements or settlements. And and I, I, I think that ultimately the court will likely approve the settlement, actually. Um, but I found it a difficult argument to read. The person who has the most problems with the settlement, even though it leaves the Sackler family tremendously wealthy and relatively insulated from the impact of a real financial judgment against them, is the bankruptcy trustee. And the bankruptcy trustee's concerns are that a settlement like this sets up a precedent that any corporation might essentially use bankruptcy as a way to avoid mass tort liability for really broadly offensive conduct to the public. I, I think that's actually a risk in most cases. I, I think bankruptcy often is used as a workaround for avoiding really serious liability for mass torts, but you know this would really cement it. And I think that's the bankruptcy trustee's concern. But as Kate said, at oral argument, Justice Kagan in particular kept hammering away at the people who are parties to this entire lawsuit are really on board with this. They want the money that will come to them. The municipalities and localities want the money that's coming to them so that they can fund um, addiction services and deal with the fallout of the opioid crisis in their communities. So really the only person who's a little swicked about this is the U.S. government, and maybe that's not so bad. Can I ask you a question just has nothing to do with any of this, just because I'm curious? Uh, why is it if we're talking about bankruptcy and civil cases, someone like Alex Jones, who had a huge civil case against him and then was supposed to pay billions of dollars, is just doing his show like no one's business. Like where, how come he's not suffering? Shouldn't he, shouldn't he, shouldn't he be paying money? Like how is he doing his show? How's he paying all those people? Doesn't he owe billions of dollars? Like I don't understand how the civil case works and I don't understand how the bankruptcy works and I don't understand why it seems like we're creating this system in which the ultra rich do terrible things because they can afford it. So I don't know the ins and outs of the Alex Jones bankruptcy settlement or um, – and I don't know who exactly was sued by those families in, from Sandy Hook. Uh, but it could be the case that his show and quite a lot of his holdings are held in like a limited liability corporation or some other corporate structure that insulates that wealth from what he is personally – liable for. So th this is just standard stuff. This is why the corporate form exists, basically, to limit liability. Um, so that might be part of it. Um, I think he also, doesn't he like live in Florida or something? And Florida has a homestead <laughs> exemption from bankruptcy. So like you- Where no laws are? Florida, bankrupt. where no laws exist? Well, I mean, it's a law-free. <laughs> I'm from Florida. So like, like yes. Um, I- I think that's that might be part of it too. I mean, like you know, certain jurisdictions have particular provisions exempting certain kinds of assets from bankruptcy. So even if you go through bankruptcy, you still may be able to retain some of your assets. Yeah. Well, it's pretty gross. And I have to tell you, it kind of leads me into the next case I want to talk to you about, which is like, if you have enough money, can you change the laws to benefit yourself? And so the next couple of cases I 
I, I want you guys to talk about is, and I know you just did an episode of Strict Scrutiny on this. Um, it has to do with a decision made in 1984 in a case called Chevron v. NRDC. Can you tell us why the 84 Chevron deference is important and now what is on the line with that? So it's you know, a 40-year-old precedent that the case, the details of the case are a little bit dry. Let me just briefly describe the case. It has enormous potential consequences for essentially the way we live every aspect of our lives. For 40 years, the court has basically used this idea of Chevron deference. It comes from this case from the 1980s involving a regulation issued by the Environmental Protection Agency about coal plant emissions, basically. Um, And in that case, the EPA just had a little statutory language. They needed to decide what it meant. And they decided what it meant. And it wasn't that clear from the language of the statute what it meant. And the court basically said, well, if Congress didn't actually answer a particular question, or if it left a gap for an agency that is filled with subject matter experts to fill, then we courts aren't going to substitute our judgment for the judgment of an agency about what this statutory provision means. That's the idea of Chevron deference. And again, for 40 years, it has basically governed the relationship between agencies and courts and Congress, where Congress passes laws, sometimes laws with wide, like open-ended terms, like necessary or appropriate or sufficient. And courts haven't said, well, we in our infinite wisdom are going to decide what is a necessary or sufficient level of, you know, emissions in the air or whatever pollutant in the water or amount of time to get your protective equipment on at a workplace. Like these are all questions that statutes require someone to answer all the time. And the courts have, again, for four decades, let agencies take the first pass and deferred if agencies provide reasonable answers to those questions. And And Kate, if I may, so what you're saying is when the law is ambiguous about a specific issue, and they're often written to be ambiguous to begin with because things are going to change, times change, regulations change, we get more information, scientific information changes. But when the law is ambiguous about a specific issue, the courts will defer to the agency experts who are reasonably able to interpret the law because they are the ones with the expertise in those specific realms, like environmental studies or water or medicine or whatever. The judges, the unelected judges, don't actually know as much as the agency people, so they defer to the agencies, or they have for the past 40 years. Exactly. So enter this dispute, which involves a couple of groups of herring fishermen who basically argue that a particular regulation issued by this little federal agency is inconsistent with a statute passed by Congress. The way this regulation works is there's a statute that requires monitors on board certain boats to just make sure that there's not overfishing happening in the waters of the nation, right? Overfishing is a really big problem. And this statute recognizes that and creates this monitoring program. But the statute doesn't say who pays for these monitors who have to be on boats. So this agency has decided that in some instances, the ship owners have to actually compensate the monitors. And these ship owners are really unhappy with this, right? They don't want to pay for the monitors. They actually say they're fine having the monitors on board, but they don't think they should have to pay for it. And they don't want to pay rather, for their own narc. Right. Right. <laughs> Again, they're actually fine with it. Which they really should be doing. Thing. Which they should be doing. We don't yeah. want to overfish, but they don't want to pay right. for their own hall monitor. Got it. Exactly. And but rather than seek a change at the agency level or a change in the statute, they are basically coming to the courts and and saying to the courts, not only should you throw this regulation out, you should jettison this long-standing idea that agencies get to decide questions at all, where there's a gap in a statute for for someone to fill. And so it's this very, very big ask that fundamentally is about disempowering agencies, disempowering the administrative state, and leading to widespread deregulation. Because agencies are the ones who do most of the work of governance. And if you say agencies can't, courts, and particularly this very conservative Supreme Court, is likely to read statutes in ways that are hostile to demonstrate antipathy toward broad agency power and significant agency regulation. And so that is really what's at stake in this case. So so can I add some context, too, for the Chevron decision from 1984? Um, That was during the Reagan administration. And so the question was whether or not the agency... um, could interpret the statute, could offer a reasonable interpretation of the statute and fill the gap that this ambiguity created. And the the court and many of its conservatives signed on for this project because I think they were okay with agency deference in a circumstance where the agency was going to be a Republican administration. And, you know, they might have been okay with the oscillating fortunes of, you know, at some point, maybe the agency is going to switch hands, it's going to be in the hands of a Democrat. But this came up at oral argument in the case um, 
when, when it was heard, what changed? What basically intensified the conservative antipathy for this decision. And it has become a kind of bete noir of the conservative legal movement over the last 10 or 15 years. And, you know, I think one of the things that changed was that we've become so polarized, Republican and Democrats have become so polarized that a Democratic administrative agency is doing a lot of progressive things that maybe corporate interests, again, who that don't like regulation, do not want. Another thing that has happened is that Republicans have managed to stock the federal courts where a lot of these questions about agency deference really do arise. And so in a circumstance like that, where you maybe are skeptical of what the progressive administrative agency would do, but you're you understand that there are a wealth of conservative judges who have their own interpretations that are perhaps more friendly to deregulation, it makes sense that you would want to arrogate that power to the judiciary as opposed to the shifting fortunes of the administrative state. And so I think that's an important thing to remember. Like This was initially a conservative decision that conservatives really liked until they lost control of the presidency and the executive. The executive became more progressive, and they were able to have a reliable bench of very conservative judges who were hostile to the prospect of regulation. It's amazing how many things are like, this is a 40-year plan. You know, Overturning Roe is a 40-year plan. This thing to take over the courts was a 40-year plan. This whole thing with getting deregulated regulation, deregulation coming out. This also feels like a long-term plan by sort of big moneyed groups, the same ones that spent money to buy influence with our federal justices, to strip agencies of their authority. They want consumer protections gone and they want the agencies that monitor them to be toothless. These are the people that do not want regulations on any of the industries that might limit their profits in any way. And to be clear for people, we're talking about regulation on things like our air and our water, on civil rights, on education, on, you know, federal agencies that look out for financial predators or regulate the safety of our drugs and our medical devices. We're even talking about stripping these agencies that safeguard the American worker from their dangerous work environments or financially abusive employers who take their tips and, you know, make them work overtime without money. These are federal agencies that look out for these things. And we're talking about Getting in there and having the agencies that monitor this bad behavior have their hands tied because essentially what would happen here is the judges with no specific expertise, instead of people who spent their entire lives studying these highly complex issues, um, would be in charge of creating the rules to regulate these industries like environmental health or public health protection for workers or the healthcare system. So it would kind of upend the way agencies work with legislation and yet again, throw open the door to more big money influence in our government. You know, it would depend a lot what the court said would replace Chevron. So it is possible, and I suspect John Roberts is interested in this, although I doubt he gets a majority on board. They might say something like Chevron needs to be reined in a bit or modified, but we're not going to totally jettison the idea of courts deferring to agencies. But more likely, I think, is they do overrule Chevron, and that would shift a tremendous amount of power to courts. Now, agencies would still do some things. They would still issue regulations, for example. But if a challenge to one of those regulations was filed, the court would basically say, well, we are the ones who are going to decide what the statute means. We don't have to pay any special heed to the hard work that went into deciding what particular language and statutes should be understood to do. Instead, it's to us. So it sort of grows out of this enormous hubris that I think is the best way to characterize the current Supreme Court in decisions like Dobbs and I think a lot of the ones that we're likely to see this term. And I think you also have to understand this in terms of a kind of vacuum of power at the legislature. Like, yes, a lot of this could be solved if Congress wrote more particular and specific laws or if Congress went back and addressed ambiguities that exist in laws that are already on the books. But you've seen this Congress. Like, I mean, they can't even elect a speaker in less than two weeks. Like, they're not going to be able to address those kinds of details. And maybe they don't even have the kind of expertise that you would want. I mean, you, you mentioned Marjorie Taylor Greene earlier in the show. Like, imagine relying on Marjorie Taylor Greene to determine what is the acceptable level of particulate matter that can be released into the air. Um, so, I mean, there are real questions of expertise and then just sort of pragmatic considerations of polarization that make the legislature perhaps ill-suited to address these kinds of gaps in legislation. And so, that in the absence of Chevron, 
the power then goes to the courts to decide what they want. And you know, if you have had this 40-year project to stock the federal courts with reliable conservatives who are hostile to regulation, you can see where this project is going to lead. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me like the result would be that the courts would be flooded with lawsuits from big money interests seeking to overturn every single regulation they didn't like and bringing lawsuits just to judge shop for someone that would overturn the law for them. I mean, as I understand it, there's also like 19,000 cases that have used the Chevron uh, decision as part of their decision, right? So if that case is overturned, that kind of throws every case that's ever used it as precedent into question. There will be a flood of cases going to the courthouse in Amarillo, Texas, where Judge Matthew Kesmerich sits like 100%. Um, they will find a way to get them there. And, and Justice Jackson actually raised this point in oral argument in this case. Like she noted, you know, I'm a little skeptical of the prospect of every ambiguous term in a statute having to be litigated to determine its meaning. Oh, God. It's a travesty as far as I'm concerned. Um Speaking of travesties, uh, let's talk about January 6th, the Fisher v. United States case, right? So this case centers on January 6th defendant named Joseph F Fisher, uh, and if he can or cannot be charged under a 2002 law that was passed following the Enron Corporation collapse um, that's called the Sarbanes-Oxley -Oc Act. It has a provision in it that punishes anyone who otherwise obstructs, influence, or impedes an official proceeding. Now, the government is using this particular statute from the Enron decision in more than 200 cases that they have against Capitol rioters, and they plan to use it to prosecute Donald Trump. Um, there's lots of other charges that these people are up on, but the Sarbanes-Oxley Act has one of the highest penalties, often coming with a sentence of up to 20 years. So the question is, can this provision be applied to January 6th defendants, or is it limited to the destruction of documents or other ev evidence that Congress had in mind when they passed the law? So where do you think we're going with this one? So this, I think, is going to be a really important and, and again, one of those cases that may go under the radar, or, or maybe not, given how many January 6th um, defendants have been prosecuted under the statute. But it is, as you say, a statute that arises out of the Enron scandal of the early 2000s. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley, or SOX as it's known by um, corporate lawyers, uh, is intended to address all of those questions and you know, the prospect of destroying evidence with, with regard to this kind of broad financial investigation. And so the question here is, can a statute that was animated out of a particular context um, with particular meaning, can it then be applied to a circumstance that's a little outside of that meaning? So, you know, the question here is that Fisher was prosecuted under this statute for the role he played in the January 6th riot on the Capitol. And, you know, he argues that he shouldn't be prosecuted under the statute, one, because he wasn't at the Capitol for very long on January 6th, two, because the statute is actually meant to address evidentiary questions regarding witness tampering um, in the context of an investigation like Enron, as opposed to something like January 6th. And it is, as you say, a question with real consequences, because there have been more than 200 other January 6th defendants who have been or are being prosecuted under this statute. And it is part of the case that Jack Smith has brought against Donald Trump and that January 6th indictment that is supposed to start trial on March 4th and may or may not start trial on March 4th. I mean, it seems like in recent cases, the court's been hesitant to over-criminalize people or allow prosecutors to use specific criminal laws in different, broader contexts. It seems to me that they they're hesitant to do that. It also seems like they do it to serve their own agenda. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, a, a trend that we've remarked on a lot on strict scrutiny is a, a disinclination on the part of the justices to allow sometimes broadly worded federal statutes to be used to criminalize political corruption. Um, so that's actually, there have been a number of cases reversing convictions against politicians and individuals who worked with or paid what were characterized as bribes to politicians. And in all of these cases, the court has basically found that federal prosecutors overreached or they misused these broadly worded statutes. And, um, and you know, in general, I think there is a well-founded concern in giving federal prosecutors who are charging crimes with sometimes savagely long sentences attached, this kind of unbounded discretion. And so that is a real problem. I mean, yet I think the court's corrective is also deeply problematic in that it has basically insulated a lot of wildly corrupt activity from potential criminal consequence and thus, I think, enabled politicians to basically proceed 
unconcerned about the possibility that they may face consequences in terms of federal criminal charges. So that's a little bit different from this case, but I think it's an important backdrop in terms of the way the court has proceeded in recent challenges to broadly worded statutes. Um, so I think there's a you know decent chance that this Fisher argument is successful. I mean, and I think it, it matters a lot for both this defendant, other defendants convicted under the same statute, and of course, the most high profile defendant to be charged under the statute, Donald Trump, although he's also charged under two other statutes. Um, but one thing I might say, uh, Melissa, I'm not sure if you agree with this, but there's also this, there is this state of mind question, right? Did this Fisher have the right, the, the kind of intent that's required to violate this statute when he says he sort of showed up, he didn't realize what was happening, and that makes unjust this conviction, right? It's not he, his conduct and his state of mind didn't satisfy the requirements of the statute. I'm just not sure Donald Trump has the same arguments available to him. So I'm not sure it's totally the case that Trump's fortunes rise or fall with whatever the court does in the Fisher case. Right. Like Fisher could have got caught up in the heat of the moment, but Donald right. Trump was the heat of the moment. Correct. <laughs> Got it. Now, listen, obviously, there's so many more cases I could talk to you about. I wanted to talk to you about bump stocks. I wanted to talk to you about, you know, everything. It's just even when you look at what people think the most important cases are of this term, they don't agree. <laughs> that Chevron thing comes up a lot, though. I will say that. Um, but before I have you go, can you guys just give me a sense of how we're supposed to take this particular court seriously? Because Melissa spoke to this at the beginning of the episode, and I, I just... This is clearly just a deeply compromised group. I mean, here we are, we're talking about Donald Trump inciting an insurrection and if his violent army members are going to be held accountable. And, and three of these nine people making the decision were given their job by Donald Trump. Six of the nine people were chosen by the incredibly powerful Federalist Society who have serious right-wing religious zealot big money plans for this country. These justices were put on this court for a reason it's clearly an activist court, but not an activist court for we the people. So how are we supposed to feel about that? What are we supposed to do about that? Because it's hard to see all these important cases that are coming down, these things that will really change the way we do things in America, and know that this is the court that's making those final calls. I think it's less of an issue that Donald Trump nominated three members of the court. I mean, I think we've seen in the past that there have been justices who are willing to part company with the president who nominated them. So, you know, Clinton versus Jones, where the court held that Bill Clinton had to go through the civil trial again that Paula Jones brought against him and that accommodations could be made to deal with the demands of the presidency. Clinton appointees went on with that. They went along with it. So, I mean, I, I think there can be sort of an acoustic separation between the president who nominated you and your decisions um, with regard to that president. I think that's likely to be the case, at least for some of these justices here. But I think the bigger question that you ask is about the ties between this court writ large and the conservative legal movement and a broader 40-year project to use the court's an institution that you know is necessarily a minoritarian institution, like you know, judges, federal judges are not elected by the people, um, and they have life tenure, so there's no way that they're accountable to the people. So they are by nature a minoritarian institution, and there has been, I think, a very concerted effort over the course of the last forty years to use the courts as a way to advance a domestic policy agenda that conservatives know could not be achieved in majority politics because the gross majority of Americans are against it. The gross majority of Americans do not want it to be 1954. The gross majority of Americans do not want to watch women bleeding out in parking lots. And yet, here we are. We'll learn a lot from the justices based on how they respond both to the immunity argument and to the 14th Amendment argument. And I think they will either regain some of the plummeting legitimacy in the eyes of the public um, that we've seen in the last year or so, right? Supreme Court approval ratings are at historic lows, and I think deservedly so. And so I think we will see whether there is an ability to separate themselves from the partisan agenda of the party that appointed a majority of the justices. Certainly, historically, that is, as Melissa suggested, very much something justices have been able to do. I'm not positive how predictive past is here, right? Um, I think it a little bit remains to be seen, although even the Trump appointees have broken from Trump, um, including in a case involving his documents out of Manhattan. Um, so so that is at least conceivable. Um, but I think that if the justices continue to show themselves not to be functioning in this genuinely independent way that 
they're supposed to be under our constitutional design, they will deservedly continue to lose public faith and there'll be an important need for other institutions to respond to curtail their power. Right now, they exercise enormous and outsized power and to the detriment of democratic politics. And the public, as you sort of started by noting, is not paying sufficient attention to this institution, which is so critical. And so I think that that is one possibility. I wouldn't call it a silver lining because who knows what gets lost along the way. But if the court continues on the path that it's on, I think that responses on the part of the public and other institutions are almost certain and actually would be important to restoring a more healthy balance of of power kind of in the democracy. And we're seeing some of that. Like, I mean, the court's public approval ratings are at the lowest that they have ever been in the history of collecting public approval responses on the court. So, you know, that's really important. So, you know, people may not be tuned into the court in the way that we would like, but they are hip to the idea that there's something off with this court. And, you know, the court, unlike Congress, does not have the power of the purse. It can't withhold funding. It's not like the president. It can't command an army. It doesn't have the power of the sword. It literally depends on the public believing that what it is doing is legitimate for its institutional credibility. And so when the public parts faith with the court, that's a really significant moment. And I think it's something that in the past has given the court pause and it should give the court pause. Yeah. Obviously, we just have to continue to pay attention to what they're doing. We have to, as you guys say, (laughs) strict scrutiny on them, right? I mean, that's the point. What Because they do respond to public shaming and attention. The fact that Alito and Thomas can take all of those perks and bribes and still be sitting there ruling on our lives like, what are you going to do? It's hard to take, but I think the more attention we put on them, the more they know that we're watching, the more people that are, as I said at the beginning of the episode, paying attention to the courts, the better off we're all going to be. I want to thank you both for joining me today and going over all this important stuff. I think knowledge is the first step to action and action really is the cure to despair. So thanks for keeping us informed. And tell people how they can find your work and follow you when you're not on this show, please. So we are on all kinds of social media. We are on Twitter slash X. Like I just keep calling it it Twitter. We can't call it X. I I mean, like his mama called him Cassius Clay. I'm going to call him Cassius Clay. It's Twitter (laughs) to me. Um, but I am Prof M. Murray at Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, uh, Threads, all the places, really. And you can follow Strict Scrutiny. We're actually Strict Scrutiny underscore is our Twitter handle. And our shows drop every Monday morning, and we stay on top of what the court is doing when it's hearing arguments and deciding cases um, and going deep on other topics uh, during the weeks in between. So that's where you and can And if find we've us. learned anything, then this is what we need to be keeping up on. So definitely be listening to Strict Scrutiny every Monday. Um, thank you guys again for coming. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much for having us. So that was Melissa Murray and Kate Shaw from Strict Scrutiny, reminding us to keep our attention on the Supreme Court. There are cases before this group of people that limit our human rights, override our state rights, could change the way America regulates our industries, and this is not something we can sleep on. I know it's exhausting to have to be on guard all the time, but the way our government is running right now, constant vigilance is the only way to protect ourselves if we want to turn things around. I want to thank Melissa and Kate for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now pay attention as those Supreme Court decisions come down. And if you aren't happy with them, let it be known. Until next week, peachy out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.